Well, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome Professor Carol Sikora, uh, the Chief Medical Advisor for the Rutherford Cancer Centres in the United Kingdom, an oncologist and uh, former Chief of the World Health Organization's Cancer Program and a founder uh, of the company running the Rutherford Cancer Centres. Uh, welcome, Professor Ka uh, Carol Sikora. What is proton therapy and what do you see as the, the key potential benefits for improving results for some cancer patients? So proton therapy is just a form of radiotherapy. The actual end product is very similar to conventional radiation. About half of all cancer patients get radiotherapy at some point in their journey with cancer. The advantage of protons is in a very small percentage of patients, probably around 10%, where the anatomy of the cancer and the anatomy of the normal tissue surrounding it is such that by using protons which stop, the radiation energy stops in the body, you get much better delivery to the cancer without damaging surrounding normal tissue. So different parts of the body, you get different effects. Children's tumors, brain tumors, esophageal cancer, uh, left-sided breast cancer because of the heart underneath, and a variety of abdominal and pelvic tumors. It, it's really two different types of plan are made, one with conventional, one with protons, and if the protons are better, let's go with the protons to spare the long-term complications of radiotherapy. And the idea is very much we select people, we have a panel that we discuss the cases, we review the, the images, the CT scans, the MR scans, and then calculate whether there would be a significant advantage of protons. I mean, the, the, the timing, the, 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 the mechanism of delivery, the sort of how the machine behind me looks like, it's very similar to a conventional. There's not really much difference. And the immediate side effects are very similar. The key to the future is the, are the long-term side effect. Protons, because they stop in tissue, um, it, basically they have far less long-term side effects on tissues beyond the cancer because they stop in the cancer, basically. The whole of radiotherapy is about making the delivery more precise. And so all sorts of tools, better imaging, better ways of visualizing the cancer, that's a great help. Better information technology, the IT systems are fantastic now to demonstrate where the radiation is going. And better equipment for delivery, like the machine behind me. We can, this is a massive machine, you can't see most of it, it's all hidden behind the panels. But it can deliver millimeter accuracy, uh, radiation which kills cancer cells just within a millimetre of where you want it to go. So everything has to be precisely aligned. What do you see as the role of the private sector? You, you've expressed there a concern about the delay in the translation of research into clinical practice. Do you see the private sector as leading in innovation? What is your approach there? So, so I've worked in the public sector for, for 40 years as a physician and it's, it's sort of great to come into the private sector because it's far more innovative and you know in Australia you've got a, a healthy mixed economy of public and private providers not just for cancer but for the, all your health care. I think the partnership model is far the best one. Uh, we can do in the private sector, we can get capital funding easily, we can build things quickly, we don't have the bureaucracy and we can move forward with innovation. So it's likely that many developments in the future in cancer and other uh, diseases will come in the private sector and then be used in the public sector, hopefully under partnership agreements. My final question for you is, if a patient is watching this and is being offered the option of conventional radiotherapy or proton therapy, and you've indicated conventional radiotherapy is developing in its precision as well. What sort of questions should they ask their oncologists to help them decide whether proton therapy is for them? Number one, will it increase the chances of cure for the cancer? And number two, will it reduce the chances of long-term side effects? These are the two questions. It may be that there won't be an increase in cure. Well, that's fine, provided there is going to be a reduction in long-term side effects. And, uh, you know, if the chances of success are high, say 80%, what you don't want 10 years on 
are side effects caused by the radiation. And the side effects you get with radiation critically depend on which part of the body is being radiated. So they're totally different from radiating the brain compared to the pelvic areas, or down at the prostate or the bladder or somewhere like that. So uh, ask the physician, what's the advantage? That's all that matters. Because even though it may be that insurers will pay the costs of protons, it may be much more inconvenient. You may have to travel to a right across Australia to get it or even to another country. So it's always going to be more difficult and more inconvenient to get protons. But if there's an advantage, it's almost certainly worth doing. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thanks for giving us the time. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Tembi, who's a senior therapy radiographer uh, at uh, Thames Valley Centre in the Rutherford Centre. Welcome uh, to this conversation with Australia. Can you just tell us what your job is? What do you do with proton therapy patients over there in the United Kingdom? Okay, hi, my name is Tembi, a senior therapy radiographer here at the Rutherford Cancer Centre in Thames Valley. So as a senior therapy radiographer, I'm involved in the patient's pathway, literally from diagnosis um, up to end of treatment and follow up as well. Where are you standing now? What is that machine? And what happens when the patient comes in for proton therapy what happens to them? Okay, so currently I'm standing in our Lina bunker. As you can see, this is the Proteus One machine um, that we use every day to deliver highly targeted, or should I say highly sculpted um, radiation doses to a precise um, tumor location inside, um, inside your bodies. Um, so what we do here is that we use um, protons, which is a different form of radiation therapy. So the properties of the high energy protons allows us to be able to deliver a targeted dose where it's needed the most and ensure there is no exit dose, unlike the conventional methods of radiotherapy treatment. So in us doing that, it has allowed us to deliver high dose um, radiation um, treatments. So it's the capability to dose escalate and the capability to actually minimize any injury to surrounding structures. And when the beam is, is uh, being used, does the patient feel anything? So this treatment is painless. The patient will not feel anything. You might hear some sounds, but that's literally from the machine, which is similar to conventional radiotherapy when you're moving the treatment machine around, but it's nothing um, significant to cause any sort of anxiety, should I say. Thank you. And how long have you been working in, in cancer care? So I've been working in cancer care since 2013 when I qualified um, and I have worked in different organizations, um, the national health system, I've worked in other organiza private organizations as well prior to coming here, um, use so many different technologies but to be fair I will say I absolutely love uh, Proton. I feel it, it just, you know, supersedes um, anything that I've used before. Thank you so much for talking to us. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it gives me great pleasure now uh, to welcome Mike Moran, MBE, who's the CEO of the Rutherford Cancer Centres in the United Kingdom and founder and you've been an executive in the healthcare and defence industries, uh, senior executive for many years. Thanks for talking to us. Can you just begin with a sort of snapshot overview of where the Rutherford centres are in the United Kingdom and why you see the network and the placement of the network as crucial to what you're trying to do to improve the experience for patients and families? Yeah, well, thank you, Julian. Thank you for inviting me onto this channel to talk. So we have four centres across the UK. 
uh, the first centre to be operational in the UK for proton beam therapy was in Newport, South Wales. And as we were building that centre, we had three other projects on the go. So Northumberland in the northeast, Thames Valley, where I am today, in the south, and uh, Liverpool in the northwest. And all of our centres deliver, um, well, the centres of excellence, they deliver a, a whole gambit of services from imaging, which includes ultrasound, mammography, MRI, CT. Then we do chemotherapy, so chemotherapy, immunotherapy, radiotherapy, and of course, high energy proton beam therapy. And how many of your centres offer proton therapy now and in the future? So we have three centres fully operational for proton beam therapy in Newport, South Wales, Northumberland and where I am in Thames Valley. And of course, the machine is right behind me. They're all single room centres. So one cyclotron, one room. So that gives me great efficiencies across the network. And in our centre in Liverpool, later on this year, we'll rig the uh, fourth uh, uh, proton beam therapy machine. That will take then nine months to commission and then we'll be fully operational with Proton across the UK. Could you tell us a little bit more about uh, your relationship as a private provider of cancer services, including proton therapy, with the National Health Service? Because you'd be aware here in Australia, we have clinicians... Uh, who work in both sectors, and that is a common practice, but I think it might be a little different for you in the United Kingdom. The relationship with the NHS is evolving. Um, COVID we see as a catalyst for change uh, for that to happen because the NHS required uh, more services from the private sector. But in particular, you know, all of our oncologists are NHS oncologists. They work with us on practice and privileges. So what we've done uh, to work with the NHS is we've educated a lot more oncologists. So I think we've had around 65 oncologists go through the uh, training program with the University Hospital Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So that's uh, at UPenn and that's around proton beam therapy training. So now in the UK, we've got significantly more oncologists trained in uh, proton beam therapy. But in terms of our direct relationship and contracts with the NHS, that's evolving every day. So we have a number of contracts for diagnostic work, for radiotherapy work and for SACT, so systemic anti-cancer therapies like chemotherapy and immunotherapy. So we want to work closer with the NHS. We have a contract in Taunton. So in addition to our cancer offer, we're also building a network of diagnostic centres because in my thinking, it's really important to diagnose as early as you can and then seamlessly move and transition through into the treatment phase. So as soon as you diagnose cancer, you can then uh, seamlessly move in and treat patients. Well, look, Mike Moran, thank you so much uh, for talking to us. It's just been really interesting to learn about the experience in the United Kingdom. Thank you. Well, it's my great pleasure to welcome Emma, who's joining us in the Proton Therapy Bunker at one of the Rutherford Cancer Centres, I think in Thames Valley. Welcome. Can you introduce yourself and explain what your job is there at the Rutherford Centre and, and how we'd describe it here in Australia? Because I think the language is a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah, sure. So I'm a senior therapeutic radiographer. In Australia, the equivalent is a radiation therapist. Um, and my role here is really to work both on standard conventional radiotherapy, but also with the proton beam machine as well. And from the point of view of a patient, how much of a different is, difference is there between being treated with conventional radiation therapy or proton therapy? Can you give us a sense of, from the patient and family point of view, how different is it? Um, well, I guess the first main difference is the timing. So conventional radiotherapy can, you know, sometimes take anywhere from 15 to kind of half an hour, um, whereas your proton beam therapy typically takes a bit longer. Um, and that can be for multiple reasons. It's not so much that the treatment itself is longer, but actually the setting up process and the verification process can take some time. 
because what we do is we've got a couple of different types of verification images on the Proton machine. So we've got uh, comb beam CT, um, which allows us to have quite a large kind of field of view and a 3D view of what's going on inside. And then we also have KV imaging, which takes kind of a little snapshot to confirm position. So typically for a Proton patient, I would always advise them that they'll probably be on the bed for about 45 minutes. Now it might seem like a really long time, but actually, all we're requiring the patients to do is lie on the bed and stay nice and still and breathe away normally. So in terms of what we're actually asking from the patients, it's very similar to your conventional therapy, just a little bit longer. Tell us a little bit about what you do to support the patients and family before the treatment and after the treatment, because my understanding is you manage to have a, a, uh, an ongoing relationship for the patient family as they go through the process, is that correct? Exactly right. So before the patients come in for treatment, they obviously have to have their planning appointments where we create any immobilisation to keep them nice and still. So for example, for brain or head and neck patients, we would have the head and neck shell that keeps them nice and still. And sometimes for abdomen patients, we might create a vac bag, which is almost like a bean bag that we suck the air out of and it kind of keeps to the shape of their body. So when we have that appointment, we actually spend quite a lot of time with the person and with their family members if they'd like them to be present, explaining the procedure, reiterating you know, what the potential side effects may be. We talk through actually kind of what to expect with the treatment. Um, and what we do is we get baseline information from them. So we don't just look at patients in, term of, in terms of side effects. We also look at them from a holistic point of view. So we kind of evaluate how they're feeling, um, you know, if they have any worries about the treatment. We look at, you know, emotional concerns, spiritual concerns. And um, what we do is then we get them in touch with the appropriate people. So at the Rutherford, we have, you know, counsellors available, not just to the patients, but also to their family members if they feel like they need that support. We've got complementary therapies like reflexology. We have physiotherapists as well. So actually physiotherapy is a really upcoming kind of um, supportive care measure that's useful for a lot of patients because as I'm sure you're aware, fatigue is a really big side effect that we see from all types of cancer treatments. And gentle exercise is really, really good at helping to combat fatigue and minimize it. So our physiotherapists work really closely with our patients. We've also got dietitians, we've got speech and language therapists. We kind of have um, a multidisciplinary approach to kind of how we deal with patients and also their families to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and supported through the journey. Do you use play therapists uh, with younger children? We do, yes. So play therapy is really good at introducing children to medical procedures. So here in this centre, we actually have a playroom that's been built specifically for young children. And in that playroom, we have things like, we have what we call a kitty scanner. And basically it's a scanner built by Philips and it's a, it's a small version of what our big CT scanner is. And it comes with these little toys. They're like little, um, we've got like a crocodile, an elephant, a duck, and they have a little chip in them. So what you do is with the child, you get the teddy bear and you pop it into the scanner and the scanner registers that it's actually got that teddy bear in there. And on a big TV screen, it pulls it up and explains kind of, you know, what you can expect from a scan and it's got a little cute story with it. Look, just before I let you go, can you just very briefly explain where the bed is, where the patient lies and possibly in their sort of bean bag that's got the air sucked out of it and where the beam comes from, just so people get a sense of what, you know, how it's delivered, the proton therapy. Sure. So um, the patient will lie on this bed here. It's a carbon fibre couch. It's got a few different attachments that we can use depending on the body site. And it's pretty similar to the kind of couch top that you would use in conventional radiotherapy. Now this couch top is then attached to a robotic arm and the robotic arm can move on different angles to be able to get to the right treatment position. The treatment comes out of the head of the machine here. So all of our protons are coming out of this central bit here. Now, I don't know if you can see in the background, but um, this white kind of almost treadmill looking thing here is what we call the gantry. And this can actually rotate the head of the machine all the way round to the bottom. And um, these here are some imaging panels. So they're what we use to take verification images. 
And how long have you been working in the United Kingdom and are you coming back to Australia? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I left home in 2019, so I've been in the UK for nearly three years now. Um, and yes, in coming years, I would like to come home and kind of continue my work in Australia. Hopefully by then Protons will be open so um, I can come and keep doing work with Protons. I just have a British partner, so I have to get him on board to move over first. <laughs> Well, look, thank you so much for giving us time, particularly during COVID. We, it was absolutely fantastic to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for talking to me.